is that time I can see the numbers are just increasing at the moment. As people are logging on, good morning to everybody. Happy Sabbath. Morning. Just Sabbath. good to see you all. Yeah. 20th of February, 2021. Um, we're grateful that we can be here. We're grateful that despite the week that we've had, we can come together on Sabbath day to be refreshed, to be revived, recuperated if necessary, and to give thanks and glory to God for all the wonderful things that he's done. Um, this week we are giving special prayers of praise and thanksgiving as my mom came home from hospital two days ago, on Thursday I think it was, Amen. Um, after going into hospital and contracting COVID and then going back into hospital, dying of COVID. She came home um, on Thursday, recovering at home. So I praise mm. God for his mercies and I thank you all for your prayers. Mm. Amen. We will have a word of prayer and then we will get into our lesson for the week. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful. Thankful to you for your grace, Lord, your mercy, your patience. Lord, we're thankful to you that you are nothing like us. That all the things that we are not, Lord, you are. Father, you're so faithful and loving and kind and patient. And Lord, we are grateful that we can be in your presence today on the Sabbath day. Lord, we ask that as we come that you would take away all the things in our mind which are distractions, which are impediments, and that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. May we not only feel what it is like to be in intimate communion with you but may we also be transformed by that communion and show to other people the love of christ father please bless us as we study your word this morning please enlighten our minds and change our hearts we ask these things in christ's name amen 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 we'll open with 476 476 burdens are lifted at calvary Filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and dream. But in Southampton at Calvary, Jesus is very near. But in Southampton at Calvary, Calvary. 
So the Macintosh household in particular was very much appreciating that one, as was I, as was I. Um, our scripture reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. My version is the King James, and it reads, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I would encourage us to reflect on this on this verse. Reflect on this verse. Christ said, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. I don't know about you, but when I read that, it, it's a real encouragement to me. It shows me that even for me, even for me, there is hope because Christ, my weakness, is no impediment to God's strength. Praise the Lord for that. This week, we're studying the topic of comfort my people, looking at Isaiah chapter 40 and what, what a comfort it really is. Um, a wonderful lesson, a wonderful topic. And we will be blessed this week as Brother Monty and Sister Suki lead out in the lesson. I'll hand over to you both just now. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. So, Brother Monty and I have been prayerfully looking at how we can help facilitate the lesson this week. Um, but before we start, I would like us just to say that we are facilitating. This is an interactive study. We'd really appreciate your contributions and your discussions as we talk about things. So sorry, one more, one thing. Sorry, before you get started, my apologies. Um, the youth class will also separate at this time, led by Brother Clarence. But before we go into our classes, please can we just have a word of prayer for the teachers? Elder Griffiths, please may you pray for the teachers. And let us bow our heads, please. Loving Father and loving thank you so much for this opportunity you've given to us. You know, we come to go into your words and to understand it clearly. I'm asking that your Holy Spirit will take control, not just of the teachers, but each and every one of us. So at the end of the day, our understanding will be much better and that we will be in a better position to tell someone about you and your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. I was about to say, let's start with a prayer, but you beat me to it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so before we begin, I just want to kind of, first of all, reiterate that we are looking for interactive contributions. So please feel free to raise your hand and we will include you all. Um, I want to start the lesson by just recapping where we are in Isaiah, because um, chapter 40 is the beginning of the last third of the book of Isaiah in the Bible. So just to recap what we've learned, verse chapters 1 to 39 so far in our quarter this year. So um, the journey this quarter in the few lessons that we've done so far have taken us through various different experiences for Isaiah. Early on, chapter 6 and 7, we were looking at that conversion experience that Isaiah had when he had the coal put into his mouth and he was purged and he was cleansed. He had that encounter with God, that experience with him. We then also witnessed the story of what happens to the various kings, Ahaz, Hezekiah, the conquering of Sennacherib and how he, or Sennacherib, and how he, you know, took down the second strongest city in Judah at the time. And we're about to look at what the last third of Isaiah has to offer. So chapters 1 to 35 mainly focus on the warnings and the judgments that will come for the people of the Israelites. 36 to 39, which is what we were looking at last week, which was the invasion of Sennacherib, Hezekiah's illness. And at the end of chapter 39, we've just witnessed the Babylonians visiting Hezekiah and having the opportunity to be ministered to, witnessed to by Hezekiah. But of course, who can remember what happened from last week's lesson? How did Hezekiah treat the situation? What did he do? He sat quietly while Sister Suki asked a question. He, took, he, would say he, big up, he bigged up himself. Exactly. He took the glory for himself. He took the glory for himself. So we then go into chapter 40, which historically was written 
at a time which was approximately, give or take a couple of months, a hundred years before actually Babylon came and took away the Israelites from Judah and you know carried Daniel and the three Hebrew, Hebrew boys off. So we're, that's where we are. I think we fast forwarded maybe a few years as well from where we ended in chapter 39. And Isaiah starts chapter 40 with a rebuke, but then what we see as 40 to 66, the rest of the book unfolds, we see this inspirational gospel journey. It is the proclamation of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of eternal life. And what we see is not only does Isaiah remind us of what happened historically in the events, but he looks forward to a time when God will grant his people the blessing of righteousness, of peace. He also outlines what grace and forgiveness is in God. And we also learn about the ministry of the Messiah, the ingathering of the Gentiles and their conversion, and most importantly, the victory over sin of Satan, over sin and Satan, sorry, and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. And last, lastly, earth being recreated anew. So this is what chapters 40 to 66 have got to offer us in Isaiah. But this week, we have got just one chapter to study after many weeks of three or four. And how much of a blessing that is. So rich is the lesson in this week's um, chapter that we've dedicated a whole week to studying just one chapter. So I'm going to hand over to Brother Monty now to give us an overview of the themes that are in chapter 40. Thank you, Sister Suki. Um... What I've decided to do is to dissect the chapter into sections so we can look at it in, in, in portions. And I'm starting with verses 1 to 5. Forgive me, my notes are flying everywhere. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished that your iniquity is pardoned. When I heard the words, comforty, comforty, I thought of a town crier. Oh, yay, oh, yay. You know, when someone's making a proclamation and he's announcing something important, it says in verse three, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. When you have a VIP visiting uh, dignitaries and so on to somewhere important, what do they do? They roll out the red carpet. It's straight, it's clean, and it's prepared. It shows someone important is coming. But something else jumped out of verse 3 to me. Something from the Bible. A proclamation by so from someone about someone greater. Can anyone give me an idea who that would be? Not sure? Okay. Let's turn you, to... I got you. So, um, sorry, if you're going to lead and, and give the answer, but I was just going to say that if you see through the Bible from Genesis right up to the event itself, we see people are... We've been told that we are going... There's going to be a saviour. There's gonna be a savior. So you're, you, there are all these issues that you're having, or my people are having all these issues. But the solution, the answer, the savior is coming, is coming. And Isaiah is just the latest prophet building on a line of prophecies. And John the Baptist, who's spoken of here again, it, it's a line of prophecy. You know, sometimes we look at the prophets as having all these individual messages, which they do have some specific applications for their time. But there's also a, a train of thought, a train of prophetic line, which goes right the way from Genesis to and through Christ until the end of time. Thank you, Brother Otis. Sorry, can I just ask the Monty that for anybody that wants the biblical reference of how to reinforce what Brother Monty is saying, you can look it up in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. So Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Feel free to jot down these scriptures and look them up in your own time or have a look at them while we're reading. But we can see there that it clearly defines that um, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures out to you. So this is in verse four, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. 
it's making direct reference to how those two prophecies are joined together that as Isaiah prophesied how many years before that was the first coming of Christ and the work of John the Baptist sorry go on with the Monty yes indeed thank you Sister Suki we'll get to verse 5 and it said and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it there's a reference again in Psalms 100. Oh, brother. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to ask a question. Maybe we can consider this as we go along, but I just want to know what does it mean? What does the Bible mean when it says the glory of the Lord shall be revealed? I've got that covered. Oh, thank you. Don't give away a spoiler alert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pick it up in a little bit. Thank okay. you. Right. Let's look at Psalms 102, verse 16. Can anyone read it, please? So I've got it here. For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. And that's from the New King James Version. That's right. So all will be revealed in, when Zion is built up. I try to encapsulate verses six to eight into one segment and do you mind if I, sorry i just wanted to ask can i just give a bit of commentary about verses one to five before we move on to Please. Yes. so what we see is god is giving a message to his people that is about comfort but also about blessings and so what we're reading in verses one to five is that god never gives up on us no matter how bad thing how bad the things are that we've done so we've read in verses one chapters one to thirty nine Ahaz, Hezekiah, how but Hezekiah took the opportunity to glorify himself over the many wonders that God had done. And despite all of that sin, despite how poorly the Israelites had been led, God was still saying, do you know what? I'm still going to forgive you. I'm still, I've still got your back. So no matter how bad things are, you know, the punishments will come to an end and God will restore us to a loving relationship with himself. In the Bible that I've got, it says, to join him in a relationship means to clear out the obstacles in our life. And some of the sins that we see in the Kings from chapters 1 to 39 is pride, hypocrisy. We talked about pride a lot, didn't we? And how Ahaz was plagued with pride, hypocrisy, greed. And when these obstacles are dealt with, we are free to become the people that God wants us to be. That's all. Thank you, Brother Monte. I'll let you hand it. I'll hand over to you now for the rest. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Sister Suki. In verses six to eight, it says, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all of the goodness thereof is of the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the Lord, the people, is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God stand forever. As I hear saying, a man is but for a while. He's not forever. No matter how much we glorify ourselves or how much we magnify ourselves, we're not forever, but the word of God is. And there's a, a supplementing verse in 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, 24, 25, which basically, it says the same thing as well. Let's find it as well. I've got sticky fingers this morning, sorry. So sorry, what was it? First Peter chapter one? First Peter, first Peter one, verses 24 and 25. Let's read that verse. Right, it says, is it, has some, everyone found it? Yeah. Right. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower therefore, thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The gospel, God's word, 
endures forever. The same as Isaiah is saying that is repeated throughout history, that God's word must be preached. Jesus came and did the same preaching and taught his disciples to preach it. And we too must preach the word. You know, what I find interesting is that people that read the New Testament, many denominations, they feel that there's a disassociation between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But here we've already drawn on two examples of how what we read in the New Testament and Jesus's ministry directly refers back to the prophecy that was detailed in the Old Testament. So when we're unsure, when we need biblical proof of how to back up not only the prophecy and the direction of um, where the New Testament is leading us, we can see time and time again how the two correlate between old and new. Um, interestingly, like Brother Monty was just saying, is that not only is this prophecy about the first coming of Christ and the work of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus, but it gives us a uh, also a direct decree of the work that we should be doing today to prepare for the second coming of Christ. So what we see is in the text that Brother um, Monty just read, we're looking at how the word of our God stands forever. The work that we are doing has already been detailed. We see in Revelation chapter 14, the, th the three angels message, and we see the call of what we should be doing. And if there's any doubt as to the validity of that, we're seeing that reinforced in this lesson this week. Indeed. The next section I'm gonna look at is chapter, uh, verses nine to 11. And I call it the good shepherd because it says in verse nine, O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee upon the highest mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Last week, we spoke about all the different cities in Judah that were captured by the Assyrians. The only one left was Jerusalem. And here we are where the voice is going out from Jerusalem to the cities of Judah, the surrounding lands. That God is in control. He says, behold your God. He says, behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Verse 11, it says, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. There's some supplementary verses in other parts of the Bible to work, especially with verse 11 and 10 and 11. And Psalms 23 jumps out, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, can you I know? ask a question to the class, please? Yeah. Why do you think the representation of the Lord as a loving shepherd is a gospel good news message. So why do you think the representation of the Lord as a loving shepherd is a good news gospel message? I think he's the Lord. Go on, Sister Scarlett, sorry. No, I think he's always looking for his people even when they fall away. It's like the shepherd that has nine a hundred sheep and he one was missing and he went he left the ninety and nine and went after the one and looked until he find the one and he bring the one back into the fold. That is how God is to us. Even though we walked away from him, he never stopped seeking after us until we come back, or you know, if we don't want to, well, he can't do anything, but he's tried to find us even when we walked away. Thank you. Uh, another, another point too, Suki, is that yeah, the sure, devil sure. goes out of his way to prove that God is not a God of mercy. Mm. You know, he goes out of his way, and the people who support the idea that God 
that God is not a merciful God, that God is exacting, that God sticks behind the laws, are the same people who want to do away with the fourth commandment. Yeah. Hence the, the need for this good news to go out to everyone to prove the fact that God is a God of mercy, a God of love. Thank you, Brother Mike. Amen. I think you're contributing. I think every week you sit there and you're administering the lesson behind the scenes. <laughs> it's lo lovely to hear your contribution. Thank you. There's one thing. One thing. One thing. That's yeah. also, that also demonstrates the service um, attribute of uh, uh, Christ when we compare it to as a shepherd. Of course, the mercy, caring, loving. So that's the attribute where we all need to have in bound of the service motive. Thank you, Brother Rakesh. Thank so you. I think Brother Donald and then Otis will come to you. Don't Brother Donald? I'm kind of interested in the the topic of the lesson around comfort. Um why is it important for, it says, comfort ye my people. Um, when we think, are we always able to offer comfort? And what does comfort do? Good question. Does anybody want to venture a response before Brother Monty and I pick that up? Can I say something? Yeah, of course. You don't have to ask permission, Pastor Dan. <laughs> Um, I'll go first with the um, shepherd. It's anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. Um, the Lord would have used any any other um, imagery, but uh, context where um, he is speaking to his people is very agricultural, and um, they understand the language of what shepherd is because they're very acquainted with that. So he uses the word shepherd there. And if you read this, something the three, the rod and staff, the comfort made. Jumping now to uh, Brother Donald's question, comfort there is because the context talks about years of captivity. Um, but then God says in advance, I'm going to comfort you because the end game of this is that I will be laughing, you will be laughing, you will be rescued. So although you go through this tunnel, at the end of it, there is, there is uh, hope and there is light. And so I I'm comforting you with his words. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Otis. Um, I forget what I was going to say initially, but um, on the back of the, the comforting, the comforting, um, um, the question that you asked for the Donald, I think that in this life, there will be times where, according to what you see around you temporarily, there's little comfort because there seems to be, or there is no obvious immediate hope. There's no obvious immediate um, rescue or escape from whatever problem that we have. But the ultimate comfort that we are seeking and that we benefit from is, is that final comfort. It's the is like I say, the ultimate comfort that one day all the suffering of this world of captivity to sin will have come to an end and we will be in the presence of our Redeemer. And that is ultimately a comfort. You know, I think it's Paul that says, if we've already got hope in this life, then I am utterly miserable because, yes, this life has some things that are, you know, pleasant and happy and enjoyable, but ultimately if this is all we have we've got a real problem i think what i was going to say in terms of the um the comfort and the salvation that christ offers before we can really appreciate that comfort we have to recognize our need we have to recognize our need and if we don't recognize that we have a need for forgiveness for mercy for salvation the the offered comfort and salvation is not going to be that meaningful um, because I, me and Sister were talking about this last night, a lot of the world spends a lot of their time and effort and money trying to present an image to the world that they are better than what they actually are. So they buy a nicer car, they move to a nicer house, they buy a nicer clothes, etc. They hang with more well-to-do people or, or to give the impression that they are better than what they actually are. 
And sadly, some Christians approach the gospel with the same spirit where we want to believe or convince other people that we are better than we are. Well, if I'm so good, then I don't have any need of this salvation, this comfort that you're offering. But when I recognize myself as a sinner, that comfort, that salvation you're offering is is the exact thing that I need. Um, I, I like to um, look at it on another dimension. Um, it's nice that we can Christianize it, but um, we are in a time frame now. Um, the question that um, Donald asked is, if we, if what is comfort and if we can always comfort? We're in a, in a time period now that we have people dying and normally, before that, before this time, lots of us, when we have friends or family members that died, we could easily go and be a source of comfort to those people. But now we have it and we, we have people dying and they're basically on their own. The, the family members are basically on their own. We cannot show up to give comfort because of the situation that we find ourselves in. Hence, it's it's more difficult. It's more difficult for the people to cope. Now, what is comfort in this sense? If all of us here, if, we, if somebody, if we have somebody die, and all of us can show up to show our sympathy and let the person know that we are um, in a sense of we are rallying with them and we are there to support it kind of make them feel um, that people care and that um, they are not in this on their own. But now it's different. What, what the Salvinic plan is that Jesus is saying that no matter what we go through and no matter how it may seem that we are alone, that he's there to give us the comfort that will carry us through. He's, the comfort that he give us will give us strength. And so what happened? When we go and we support people in their grief, it means that we are saying, listen, we are lending you a little bit of our strength that you can move forward. But when you can't do that, next thing the past, the people may lose hope. And, and um, that is what Christ is offering, hope. That um, as somebody quoted and said, if in this life only you have hope, you have of all men most miserable. But you need that person may not know that passage, you may need somebody else to go and tell them, I said, listen, even though that you have this, even though that this is happening to you and it seems like there's no way out, that there is somebody who cares about you. Just to build on that, Brother Willow, I mean, yes, because when we think about comfort, often it's about giving some reassurance, giving some cheer that, because people will go through difficult times and when, God says, comfort ye my people. He was given what they'd gone through. He was trying to give some reassurance for the next day, for the future, right? Thank because you, when you're in those circum situations, sometimes you don't know how you're going to survive and cope beyond. And that's where even sometimes it's not even you have the right words, just a presence can give that comfort. We've all seen it with a child, haven't we? If they fall, you immediately want to comfort, to soothe whatever pain they may have done to make them realize the pain is only for a time and they will <laughs> overcome that. So it's this thing about looking for reassurance, which in the last 12 months has been very difficult for us to do, given, as Brother Willick said, the number of people we have known who have needed comfort and it's not just the same thing when you pick up a phone. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the actual physical presence of showing that comfort. Mm -hmm. And remember, Christ said, the main thing he says, when he left, he was leaving what? The comforter, mm -hmm. right? To give people that reassurance. So thank you, Brother Donald. I'd like, I mean, can I just check? Are we finishing at 10 to Otis? I can't hear you on mute. Yes, you please. Yeah. So a question, Sophie, before you go on. Yeah. Um, the the comforter. When I go, I'll leave you. I'll send you the comforter. Yeah. Um, how does the comforter bring comfort? How does the comforter comfort? So, 
first of all, one, I would recommend that you read this book called The Coming of the Comforter <laughs> by Leroy E. Froome, written in 1925. So that's my first recommendation. I feel like the message of comfort, although it is exceptionally soothing and very, very helpful in helping us understand the merit and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the fact that we have to call upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit to truly be comforted and to tackle the things that are happening in our life. I wouldn't want to miss the other side of the message that we have in chapter 40. So yes, the comfort element is super important, but we have to understand why is the comfort bit important? And it is because we have to recognize the authority of God, recognize the calling in this gospel message in chapter 40 and do the work that he has assigned to us. So the comfort isn't just for us. Now, I don't want to miss the opportunity to quickly mention one thing, Brother Monty, and then we're going to, yeah. I wonder if we can just quickly cover the glory of the Lord, which is a question from Otis earlier before we look at the rest of the chapter. But I have um, this Bible, it's called the Life Recovery Bible. Highly recommend it. It's written in the New Living Translation version. So very, very user friendly. But the reason why I want to quote from this Bible at the moment is because this Bible was designed to detail the 12 steps of recovery that are used in addiction programs of various different kinds around the world. But the 12 step program is... Uh, detailed using biblical references and biblical scriptures and interestingly chapter 40 the message in chapter 40 is step 11 of 12 steps of recovery so i'm gonna say that again chapter 40 is step 11 of 12 steps of recovery so for anyone that knows of or has experienced addiction and understands what it takes to get from steps one to ten it's not an overnight experience it's not just about accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Steps one to 10 are a grueling battle of ups and downs, failing and getting back on track and re, you know, re offending as it were and that up down up down up down and bearing in mind step 11 is the final is the one before the final step that message of comfort that message of patience that message of forgiveness from our lord we're not ready to hear it until step 11 so bearing in mind this bible this program was designed for all the people in the world that suffer from these issues these addictions these problems that plague them and they want to have a an experience that a gives them recovery from addiction but also brings them into a place where they're closer with god we take the message of chapter 40 for granted we think it's just about soothing our ways and making us feel better about the many sinful natures that we have and the mistakes that we make however we're not ready just for comfort. We're not ready just to hear the comfort message. The other side of the comfort message is about being prepared to do the work, accept what it takes to be in a place, not only to receive the forgiveness, but to forgive others and to be patient. Now, bearing in mind, chapters 1 to 39 have covered in detail the ups and downs hundreds of years of the experience of the kings that ruled judah up until this point the sins they commit against god how long suffering god had been so just in our own recovery journey however large or small god is long suffering with us he puts up with us when really he shouldn't elder herbert oh sister sucky thank you very much i, I really want to ask the question how are we being comforted today? You know, in, just think of everything that we're going through. Think of our own situation. How are we being comforted today? And how many of us feel we are being comforted? I know we want to rush on, but this is yeah. something I wanted to ask, but I couldn't get the opportunity earlier on. So, how are we being comforted today? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Can someone just stay? By the word of God. That's Which wonderful. we know from this chapter stands forever. What do you mean from the word of God? That doesn't, you know, if I'm someone who is not a believer, 
Well, I can still be going to church, but yet I have not got your level of faith. So how would that help me from the Word of God? So how do you get your comfort? Brother Herbert, can I venture an answer to your question? So I think I personally, so I can only speak about my experience, I am comforted currently in our current experiences of the world, what's happening, end times, et cetera, et cetera, because God is humbling me. I think anybody is capable of humility, whether they are a believer or a non-believer. Everyone has the opportunity to be humbled. And that humbling or that experience with God that allows you to be humbled is about accepting and recognizing your own faults and failures and how you have sinned against God and then having the opportunity to accept God's grace and forgiveness. So when we look at the humbling of Hezekiah, he was told he was going to die, got down on his hands and knees and begged for extra time, was given an 50, extra 15 years. He put on the sackcloth, he went into the temple, he prayed, he put all his problems before God. We see these examples of how time and time again, God will humble you and will put you in a place where you have a real experience with him and you have an opportunity to recognize and witness the magnitude of his love and grace towards us. And that's what chapter 40 is all about. Okay. The fact okay. that God allows us time and time again, and his, you know, earlier on the lesson for PowerPoint this week, the message was God's forgiveness has no limits. Okay, okay, can I, I hear that. Okay, Elder okay. Herbert, can I um, add a little bit? There are many people, um, okay, people today cope in many different ways. They watch movies a lot because it's locked down. They buy exercise bike, stationary bikes to do all that and do gym or whatever. They want to comfort themselves. But the ultimate comfort is coming from the Lord. The only problem here is that many people do not seek the comfort that the Lord gives. Um, because people look at government, they blame this and that and that. And we, we, we don't know, they don't know that... Uh, all these things play out as part of, you know, in time events. And, and many of us forget as well that um, although it seems like the rich, the powerful and all of that, and the world seems to control, ultimately the Lord is the one who controls. And so Isaiah 40 speaks of the details there that he is sovereign. You and I are simply grass we wither. And that's exactly our status and on this planet Earth. But uh, the comfort here is that God will bring ultimate uh, victory to his people. Yes. And he, we may not, the people who received this message from Messiah's time, they did not receive the fulfillment of this prophecy. They died. This is about 700 years, 800 years towards the future when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will be born because this is 8, 7, 700 BC. Uh, so uh, today, we, many of us could only be receiving the encouragement from the Word of God. And that's, the, that's our source of strength. We may not, others may not experience it uh, in their lifetime. Others may be part of the collateral damage of the sin that has plagued the earth. Uh, but then ultimately... Christ is going to be supreme. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Um, Otis, you had your hand up a couple of times. Yeah, I was going to say that. Uh, oh, really? If we jump chapter 14, um, Elder was talking about the comfort, comfort mm -hmm. comforting and comforter. Um, John chapter 14 tells us that there's the element of the comfort we receive, which is related to the word of God and confidence in what God has said will happen, will happen. And it comes by, it links to what I was saying last week, whereby we need to get to the stage as Christians where our senses do not guide our experience. So our eyes, our touch, our taste, our smell, our ears are not the primary things which we use to determine reality. Because the world around you, according to your senses, will be in all manner of turmoil. But as you have said, Suki, as the chapter 40 says, that the word of God endures forever. 
forever. And in John chapter 14, it says, I will send the comforter and he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. And so if we would only keep God's word as our foundation, all the day-to-day -day stresses of life will be secondary to the, the confidence we have in what God says he is doing and will do. Elder. Okay. Elder, will you want to say something before yeah. I say what um, I want to say? Five minutes, yeah. people. Yeah, can I just say that we are we haven't had a chance to review a massive chunk of the lesson. I'm still waiting to hear about the glory of the Lord filling the, um, yeah, filling the so world. Yeah, so my reference texts for you are going to be John 1.14, Colossians 1.27, and Matthew 25.31. It gives you three explanations for the glory of the Lord. And just to surmise, so all of you, you need to just, unfortunately, you're not to look at it outside the lesson, but John 1, 14, John 1, 14 tells us that um, the glory of the Lord is revealed in the life of Jesus. Colossians 1.27 tells us that the glory of the Lord is revealed in the life of the believer. And then Matthew 25.31 tells us that the glory of the Lord is revealed at the second coming of Jesus. So hopefully that will give you a really short synopsis as to what the glory of the Lord is, Otis. Can we allow Brother Monty just to get, cover the last few points of the lesson? And then if we want to take any further discussion, maybe we can have a little study before AY this afternoon. Is that okay? okay we've, only got, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, there's so much to talk about that we didn't cover. The, 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 the um, eyes are talking about the creator and how magnificent he is, our omnipotent and so on. But I'm going to skip through to the last few verses of the... Uh, Verse 27 onwards. Yeah. And uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 11 verse 5 says, No one knows the way of the Spirit of the Lord mm. or how a child goes in the womb. So we cannot know the works of God who makes all. And the glory of God mm. is such that we can't explain anything, but we accept by faith his power and his glory, his omnipotence. He has no beginning, has no end. Um, verse 29 to 31 it says he, mm -hmm. he gives power to the faint and to them that have no might he increases strength even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run not be weary they shall walk and not faint David said in Psalms 103 verse 5, the youth is renewed like eagles. Yeah. It also reminds us in the earth made new, we will not be weary, we will not faint, we'll never get old, we will be with him. There's been so much to encapsulate in this yes. uh, chapter. We cannot cover it all, like Sister Suki said, there's so much more we can discuss. And I'm hoping we've touched a few salient points and brought on that Yes, when this chapter was written, how many hundreds and hundreds before Christ came, the people couldn't see the comfort coming. Just like we are here now, we can't see the comfort coming. But we believe and trust in the Lord that he will deliver us. And for me, brothers and sisters, we have to recognize that ultimately the sinner may not see it, but for those who can read and study the word of God, it opens it up to you. And asking the comforter to help us to understand the word will ultimately illuminate God's word to all of us. Thank you all very much for your contribution. Sister Sukhi, over to you, the last Thank word. You. So I just wanted to say that we haven't had a chance in this bar, in this chapter to reinforce the authority of God. So God goes at great lengths to explain to us in chapter 40, verses 12 to um, 28, which is where um, Brother Monty picked it up, that the Lord has no equal. So when we're looking for answers, when we're looking for direction, when we're looking for what is the way out, what is the solution, Time and time again, we neglect to recognize that there is no power, there is no option, there is no outcome, there is no result that is bigger than God. God is the, we believe that God is the one creator. We believe that God wrote the Bible. We believe all these wonderful miracles and all these wonderful things. Yet when it applies to us in the dirtiest of the dirtiest scenarios of our life, in the grittiest moments when we're up against it, we cannot recognize that God is the one that can get us out of that situation. Just like we saw with Sennacherib and how the Israelites chose 
to have um, alliances with the Assyrians rather than accepting that God was the one that could bring them out of that situation. We too live our lives like that. So chapter 40 is pleading with you, with me, with the church to recognize God is the ultimate power in everything. And there is no equal in any shape, way or form in this universe or the next that beats God. And so when we look at our calling, our commission to be going out, to spreading the word, to spreading the gospel, giving the opportunity to reach out to those, now is a time more than ever where that is required. And we can reference this chapter time and time again to encourage people and make them recognize God's forgiveness has no limits. His love is never ending. His power has no one better or no one greater than his. And he will always be patient with us and forgive us and take us on the right path. We just have to put, look for him and find him and accept him. Amen. Any Amen. last comments or last moments while we have 30 seconds left of the 1150th minute? No, we're happy? Okay. Sabbath School Superintendent, I will return the Sabbath School service to you. Thank you. I just, I just want to say that there's something that I, I, I don't want us to miss. I wouldn't like us to miss the fact that when we talk about, when the Bible talks about the glory of God filling the earth, I used to think that, you know, it was about the brightness of the Lord or some kind of cloud or some light shining that everyone's just going to be immersed in. But an in-depth study of the scripture will show you that the glory of God filling the earth is when finally be just before the end of time where his people will have put aside all of their worldly sinful ways and God will have hundreds, thousands, millions of people around the earth reflecting his glory, living like him, being like Christ. And so when your neighbors are in the midst of the storm, they will look to their left and they'll see this bright, shining Christian person next to them who is exhibiting the love, the mercy, the grace of Christ. And this will be happening all around the place. And then, and then the end will come when God's people finally allow him to work in them and to reflect his glory wherever they go. And then God's glory will fill the earth. Yeah. Thank you for our lesson study. We will now have the mission report video. One day, 13-year-old Jared read a story about a boy named Wilford who liked to surprise people with gifts. He wrapped up gifts, tied them to a rope, and lowered them over people's walls. Then he ran and hid. Jared thought it would be fun to do the same thing in his home of Takmak, Kyrgyzstan. He asked his mom for permission to put gifts in old tissue boxes. What kind of gifts? she asked. Some toys and whatever else I can find, Jared said. His mom liked the idea. Jared and his younger brother Sam had cars and Legos that they had brought along when their family moved from Argentina to serve as volunteers in Kyrgyzstan. Many neighborhood boys were poor and didn't have toys. Jared told his school friend Camille about the plan. Let's put some toys in boxes and throw them over walls, he said. Camille grinned in excitement. He thought it was a great idea, and he wanted to help, even though he didn't have any toys to give away. The boys took two tissue boxes and filled them with Legos, toy cars, scarves, and bars of soap. Getting on their bikes, they rode to Camille's neighborhood and chose two houses at random. Jared hurled the first box over one fence and Camille threw his over the other fence. Quickly, the boys pedaled away. At Jared's house, they laughed as they imagined the surprise of the children who had received the gifts. Sam, Jared's brother, overheard the laughter. Can I join you next time? He asked. A few days later, the three boys got together to prepare more gifts. They invited another boy from school, Kozenbeck, to join them. The boys filled two shoe boxes two empty tissue boxes, and two plastic bags with a variety of toys, scarves, and soap. Loading the boxes on their bikes, they set off in search of unsuspecting homes. After a few minutes, Jared saw a house surrounded by a fence. The yard was filled with trees. Sam, he said, throw your bag into that yard. 
Sam tossed the bag over the fence, and it landed in the lower branches of a tree. Quick, do something! Sam squealed. Camille was the tallest, so he leaped over the fence. Reaching up into the branches, he grabbed the bag and dropped it on the grass. Let's go before anyone sees us, he shouted. The boys raced away on their bikes. After throwing four more gifts over fences, the boys had one box left. Jared spotted a house with a large metal gate. Quick, push the gift under the gate, he told Kozenbeck. As soon as Kozenbeck pushed the box under the gate, someone yelled, Why are you putting garbage in my yard? As the boys quickly rode away, they heard the voice suddenly exclaim from behind the gate, This isn't garbage, it's a gift. During family worship that evening, Jared and Sam excitedly told their parents about what had happened. Their dad was pleased. He led the family in prayer for all the people who had received the gifts. Jared and Sam are still throwing surprise boxes over people's fences. No one knows that they are responsible, and that's how they want it. church just want to encourage us to continue faithfully supporting the church with our tithes and free will offerings um, we are restricted with our movement but god still needs for there's so many needs still for our finances to support the world the work of the church both here and abroad so i encourage us to keep returning our tithes and offerings faithfully um, we will close with our closing hymn shortly before I do, I'd just like to say welcome to one and all. Our numbers have risen since we first got going. Um, Sister Joy, where well, Sister Joy, we've lost Joy. And we have Sherelle, Lillian, the Solomon family, and all the faces of everyone who's looking back at me. Good morning and happy Sabbath to one and all. I just want to thank our teachers for the day who agreed to facilitate the lesson at ridiculously short notice and so to god be the glory we thank you for your willingness we will close with our closing hymn 510 if you but trust in god to guide you Cheers.
powerful, powerful hymn for which some of us may not be familiar with. I'd encourage you to reflect on those lyrics when you have a moment later on today. Let us pray to close our school. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your, your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for your dependability. And Lord, we are so grateful that even though we are going through various hardships and trials on this earth, Lord, our salvation and our, our end is 100% assured in you. Lord, I pray that we would learn to look beyond the physical and look into the eternal. Lord, may that be our experience with you as we study your word and as we render obedience to you in our life. Thank you for your Holy Spirit sent to guide us and to comfort us. Lord, help us to be a comfort and a guide to other people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sabbath school is dismissed. And we'll hand over to our church clerk.